Welcome to the Quilt Shop Podcast, where we talk with quilt and sewing retailers from all across the country about the challenges of running their business and how they succeed. I'm your host, Spencer Wright. All right. Hello and welcome to the Quilt Shop Podcast. I have Sandy Labby with so much class in College Station, Texas with me. Sandy, how are you doing today? I am doing very, very well. Thank you for asking. Good, good. I'm, we are so excited to have you on here. One of the main reasons that I've asked Sandy to be on the podcast with me today is Sandy just barely opened up a quilt shop. And um, it's, it, I mean, I th- we'll kind of get into it. It's, you know, a little more than a quote shop, but, you know, really centered around classes. Um, but I, I hear from people all the time, you, you know, we know there are a lot of quote shops opening up around the U S and I just thought it would be really interesting to hear the story of someone who's in the middle of it. Um, someone who's kind of uh, a few months in and growing their business. And I think Sandy is a really prime example of someone who's doing a phenomenal job. And so that is why I really wanted to have her on here. So uh, with that being said, Sandy, could you tell us, uh, you know, give us a, a brief history or, or kind of the motivation behind you deciding to open up a shop, you know, here in 2023? The motivation for opening up a shop um, at this time um, came from uh, where I used to work. Um, The shop owner had decided that she was going to retire, and therefore I I was... um, a little disappointed, a little stunned, a little bit everything, yeah, as you sure. can well imagine, because we had an awesome community and an awesome uh, group of, of customers and folks that we worked with. But the day after the announcement went public, um, my phone blew up. Um, and, and it was along the lines of, oh, my gosh, Sandy, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go hang out? Uh, how are we going to have classes? You're a phenomenal teacher. We need you. What are we going to do? And so um, I had just come off of uh, rotator cuff surgery. So I knew that, you know, whatever I was planning on doing was going to have to look a little bit different. And yeah. so um, I decided that, well, I'll look around and figure life out. And so I came up with a business plan, uh, worked with our small business development uh, center here in the area. And um, the director of the uh, small business development center uh, met with me and the rest is history, so to say. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I think the timing of everything, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's, uh, you know, you, you wonder how things and why things happen in the timing they do, but we had just, uh, there was an announcement that they were having a, an, uh, an entrepreneurial, uh, uh, workshop locally. And so it's like, oh my goodness, this is just perfect. So I created my business plan and I went to that, learned a lot about um, developing a business, uh, what some of the risks were, how to go about the financing side of things, and then um, about cybersecurity. So it was, it was, the timing couldn't have been better. Wow. Okay. This is so fun. I, I, I love hearing about the story and I love hearing about, you know, developing a business plan and getting involved in your community, taking, you know, classes for entrepreneurs, um, local, you know, working with your local business development center, you know, all these things. I think, I feel like I, I often hear of these kind of resources and I, I wonder how often they get used. And then I hear stories like this and I'm like, that is amazing. That is the exact kind of reason that these resources, you know, exist is for people like you who identified a need in the market um, because Mm of, uh, you know, a store closure in your case. um, And which isn't always the case for when people open, open shops. But I think, you know, there was a, a need and there was a person to fill that need. And that is kind of how this started. Right. And, and, mm-hmm. I agree. I think, you know, you're kind of talking about everything happens for a reason and just how the timing, you know, of, of everything, right. The store closure. And then you're like, okay, maybe I can do this. Maybe this is something that I want, you know, for, for myself to kind of take and run with. And 
just how amazing that is. So, I mean, kudos to you. And, you know, we want to say huge congratulations on opening up your shop. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's been an entertaining adventure, to say the least. You know, um, from looking around the local community for a, uh, a, a place um, to actually um, uh, put the business. Initially, sure. it was, well, I have a sewing machine, we'll travel. And then that didn't seem to be very realistic because in looking at some of the venues, um, you know, like, let's just take a church. If they're having a wedding the weekend that I'm planning on having a class, yeah, I get I get booted out of the church because sure. you know, there's a wedding um, there. And I will say that, you know, COVID really impacted us um, and this industry dramatically. And so I looked at hotels locally, and many of our hotels had closed their conference rooms. And so those weren't available, and they didn't have the um, uh, the infrastructure within a, in, within a room for the power that was needed for, um, you know, 10, 20 sewing machines and, and little mini irons and those kind of things. So it went, it went from having the thoughts of doing something mobile to then actually finding a brick and mortar. And so, yeah. um, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and I think that that's right. I mean, we've seen quilt shops move online. Um, some of them, you know, maintain kind of an in-store and an online mm -hmm. presence, obviously like, so is, is kind of a, um, you know, a facilitator of that. I think, you know, as we as we look and you know, you're talking about how COVID affected things and, you know, just different workspaces. I'd like to maybe step back and look from a from a mic, you know, from a macro standpoint. You know, we're seeing quilt shops close and we're seeing a lot of quilt shops open. Um, you know, a, a lot of turnover in in the quilting industry right now. That's that's from my perspective. Um and I'm curious, um, were you at all afraid of, you know, you kind of you know, the fear of starting a business and starting a business that is seeing some turnover right now. Yeah. You know, tell us about your emotions that you were feeling as you decided to to open up a shop. Oh, yeah, this was it was a scary adventure. Um, but I think that you need that little bit of fear factor to um, get into the actual heart of who you are as far as Am I going to want this and to become successful? Um, there has to be an inner motivation and an inner drive alongside that fear. Um, I had recently retired from um, education. And so the education side of things and teaching classes and all uh, was not a, I was going to say that was, that's already in my blood. Yeah. Um, but the business side of things was the scary side for me because sure. I, I know about finances from managing my own home and, and all of that, but I didn't, didn't know a lot about it from managing the business side of it. I had zero knowledge of building out a website. And so, yeah, that was a little scary. Yeah. Um, you know, and then um, connecting with vendors and, you know, and looking at, I mean, I had a basic knowledge of what customer um, wish list was, but then to turn around then and build it out and, you know, and, and make it happen. I think those were some of the scary things. I think the other thing that was scary too was just knowing there were issues with cybersecurity. Um, that was one of the big things that I had found out when I went to um, the workshop that I went to. And, you know, you hear about, you know, all the different hacks and things like that. And I certainly did not want that to happen to my business. And so, yes, there was a fear factor that sat there. Um, sure. The emotional side of it, um, frustration um, set in at several points. Um, we had started out with a uh, different website company. And, uh, and then I went to the Dallas, um, quilt show and ran into Rhonda from corner square 
quilts. And uh, she, she introduced me to Rain Retail and to Like So. And she spent an hour just showing me what she had. And then my mm, level of concern um, dropped because now I had an infrastructure that I could actually like embrace and feel comfortable with. And, and that was doing the things that I wanted it to do as far as um, developing the, a business because um, I had no idea how to do this part of it. And so for me, I went from excited to scared to frustrated to then um, energized to um, probably the education side of it with like so and my training group, uh, the onboarding group, um, I became more comfortable. I had no qualms about asking questions. And so um, I think that if you want to know something, you got to ask that question. And so then it became comfortable. Um, so I've gone a gamut of emotions. Um, started with y'all in March, opened my doors in April, and here I am about two and a half, three months in. So yeah, wow. it's, it's been a good trip. <laughs> yeah, and it's been it seems like you know a little bit of an emotional roller coaster, right? Yes. <laughs> since, yes. since the start, you know, <laughs> since the you're you know kind of the inception, and you know all these emotions that you've kind of described, and I think that that emotional roller coaster is probably. You know, anyone who's listening that's, uh, you know, a current yeah. quote shop owner that, that opened a shop, I bet they felt a lot of the similar emotions, right? <laughs> that you kind of have that ride. Um, you know, one of those emotions I want to talk about, I would say, what's one thing that you were most surprised about in, in the process of opening up uh, your shop? From the get-go, I think um, finding a good space because I knew that I – I knew from – the start that I didn't want to sell fabric. I wanted to be a teacher. I want, because that's what I do. I wanted yeah. a studio. I wanted um, a, a, a place where people could come and I don't want to say hang out, but gather and have friends and develop a community, kind of the community that we lost with the closing of the quilt store that was here. And so yeah. I think for me, um, that was, that was, the most emotional part, but the surprising part for me was now that I have customers coming in the door and, um, and embracing my vision, I think for me, that becomes very emotional and it truly just on the inside of me, it tickles me, but it warms me, but I want to just have those tears of joy because it's, I know that probably sounds a little cliche, but no. when you see it honestly happening, that's the best part of the whole thing. You know, when you have a room and there's six to eight to, to 10 people in it and they're having fun because of my vision, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Oh, I mean... <laughs> I have chills, like just thinking about <laughs> kind of, I mean, like I can feel the emotion, come, you know, yeah. obviously I am not in college station with Sandy, but I can, I can feel kind of the passion and the emotion and, yeah. and the gratification that you get from yeah. being able to create that community. It, it makes me think, you know, one of the first episodes that I did was with uh, Susan from Hyder Hangout. And, um, you know, then kind of the name of her shop, you know, with hangout at the end mm -hmm. of it, very similar to what you're describing in yeah. that your shop or your classroom, um, is in a lot of ways, it's, it's a community center for yes. yeah. people and to be able to provide that and facilitate that mm -hmm. from my understanding is one of the most fulfilling things that you can do as a business owner. Right. Yes. And, yes. and of course there's a financial piece of this that makes yeah. it complicated sometimes, right. Mm -hmm. That well, yeah. in a lot of ways, my guess is your motivation is 
probably more around the gratification that you get from building community and mm -hmm. less around the financial piece of your business. But that still has to function. That still has to work, right? And Definitely. so as a shop owner, you have to weigh this, okay, how do I make the right decision for my shop financially, mm -hmm. but also build and promote community in the way that I was motivated to when I opened my shop? Is that, do you think that I'm kind of on the on the right track with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, that was one of the things when I met with the director of the Small Business Development Center, you know, how do you go about um, putting your budget together? Um, one of the things that he, he had told me, he said, well, Sandy, don't go out and buy brand new furniture. He said, furniture is a huge expense. There are many uh, um, businesses that have downsized or gone out of business. And there are other companies that have that inventory of furniture, office furniture. And so I have an awesome son who um, spent time online, looking around, finding different companies, looking at different product lines, um, all of those kind of things. And so that financial side, the burden was a little bit lessened because I wasn't buying new, um, yeah. but I was still buying excellent quality. That's um, a great tip, by the way. I just want to, I just want to highlight, that's a really cool tip. I think yeah. for, for, you know, even if you're not opening a shop, you're expanding yes. or you're looking to redo your furniture. Yeah. This is a really, really interesting point. So please continue. I just want to say that's, that's really yeah. interesting. No, so I, I ended up finding um, my uh, tables for the studio to be able to, for people to be able to, you know, put their sewing machines and cutting mats and that type of thing. Um, have found this desk that um, I'm on, um, you know, uh, very sturdy products, um, chairs, you know, things like that. I mean, there are things that, of course, are new, like a new iron and things like that. But um, yeah. uh, but basically, it it really functioned well. Um, I think another thing was um, learning how to forecast and look at that financial bottom line and try to figure out, OK, so if I offer these classes and do this, what could potentially be my income um, from that. And then how does that, um, resonate each month to, to, of course I've got bills to pay, but you know, how is that going to translate into, um, paying the bills? And you're right, you know, building a community, it's got a, um, that's the focus, but at the end of the day, you still have to make some money to be able to afford it all. So, yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. And I mean, I think, you know, talking about forecasting, um, is, you know, I think a really, really beneficial thing for shop owners to do is to, to look at what you're going to offer like a class mm -hmm. or a fabric line or whatever, and, and, and kind of look at what the bottom mm -hmm. line could potentially be, um, right. and weigh out the risk, uh, you know, of the cost versus the potential return. Right. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, when I think about quilt shops, if we took a survey of all the people who have opened quilt shops in the last 20 years, I would imagine not very many of them opened it because they wanted to make a ton of money. Right. And, and yeah. not that that can't happen. And, and I think it can be a very lucrative business. However, I don't know that that's the primary motivation in such a hobby driven business. And so then what I think is so cool is we'll have these these shop owners and they open up a shop because they're passionate about quilting or they're passionate about building community. And then they, they either come in with great, you know, kind of savvy business expertise or they mm -hmm. learn and they grow. And I see that all across the board. And it is just one of my favorite things to watch and, and to hear about people's experience of how they're effectively running their business from a, you know, kind of a profit and loss standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but then maintaining that, kind of the spirit of the hobby because yeah. that's that's what it is right and and yeah. so i don't know i just i kind of felt that as you were talking about it and i just want to say like you know huge kudos to you and Thanks. kudos to you know all the shop owners who are you know always weighing um you know kind of the passion and the you know financial side of things right 
I know for me also, I really listen to my customer base um, and look at what they're asking me to do and um, trying to um, accommodate that while still being true to myself um, and who I am and in, in mm-hmm. what I quilt. Um, you know, I've been sewing for sewing for over 60 years, uh, quilting for, oh, let's see, probably about 45 years. I started back in 1980-ish. And so a good long time. Um, yeah. Fabric- <laughs> yeah, a bit, a bit, a bit. <laughs> Seen a lot of fabric come across under my sewing machine. I <laughs> believe that. And, uh, you know, the, the fabric, um, the What's out there has certainly changed um, from your more traditional um, uh, fabrics to sure. a very modern vibe. Yeah. Um, and so um, I try to, in my class offerings, appeal to a wide variety of, of tastes. Uh, and so having had a lot of experience in sewing and in quilting, I don't think that there's much that I haven't seen um, as far as styles and types and of, of sewing and uh, quilts and looking at um, what's available. So I'm one of these that I, I like to play with fabric. And so if it's a new pattern, if it's a new technique, I'm out there playing with it and then I can turn around and offer that to my, my customer base. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's, that's really fascinating to hear kind of the, you know, trying to listen to your customers and at the same time, you know, change with the trends, do your customers mm-hmm. change with the trends and follow those? Cause sometimes they're not on a parallel path. Um, and that's, you know, certainly as a new business owner, it's something you really have to decide as you're building up stock, um, whether, you know, that's fabric or, or, or otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So I really want to get into talking about how Sandy got her, the name of her business out there as a new quote shop. But <laughs> before we do that, we're going to go to a quick break and we'll be right back. Okay. Thank you. Today's episode is sponsored by Like So. Like So helps quilt and sewing stores manage all the pieces of their business. It's great for managing fractional yards and pre-cuts, tracking inventory in-store and online, and creating classes and events that live right on your website. Like So also has built-in tools for communicating with customers so you can keep them in the loop and coming back to your store. The Like So system integrates with some of the biggest names in the industry, like Moda, Checker, Michael Miller, and more to make your processes seamless and incredibly easy. Like So does all this and more. For listeners of this podcast, Like So is offering 50% off your startup costs. Click the link in the description to schedule a demo and redeem this offer. And now back to the show. Okay, and we're back. I'm still here with Sandy and just having an absolute ball talking about opening a quilt shop, um, which is just like, I am just filled. I don't know if you could, probably a lot of you are listening to this and you can't see the screen, but I just am so, so happy to be talking to someone who's opening a quilt shop. Um, So I want to talk about how Sandy got the name of her quilt shop out there, right? That's always something that is probably pretty scary is that, People don't know about your business when you start it for the most part, unless something's gone really, really well, or you got lucky for some reason, you have to find a way to get your name out there. So Sandy, tell me what you have been doing. Okay. Um, This one's a good story. So I have been a classroom teacher. I taught math and science and, um, you know, pre-K through 12. And uh, then went on and became a principal, then went on and became a college professor. So, um, for me, the teaching side of things is, as I said before, is very intuitive. Um, and knowing that I was going to be um, wanting to open up a business, um, my we had my son and I had gone to the Houston Quilt Show, and uh, we had been um, 
sitting in his vehicle and he's like, well, mom, if you need to open up, a, if you're going to have your own business, then you need to have a cool name. He said, there's a lot that has to be said in, in the name. He says, you want to have something that's going to be memorable and, but it's going to be like totally you. And so we started just brainstorming and then um, all of a sudden so much class just came out um, because it's, Having been that that teacher, um, you know that that was where I was coming from because that was the side of this industry that I really wanted to promote because there are a lot of people that um, they they know how to sew but they need refinement they want to. Yeah. Um, be pushed into the next level of sewing. But then there's, and then having been that classroom teacher, knowing that the uh, focus in public education has changed considerably and that home economics and, you know, home management, sewing, cooking, all of those things have been removed from, from schools um, and, and our children today and our young adults don't have the opportunity to participate in those kind of things. It, it, it really bothered me. So the name so much class came from the fact that it could mean anything, um, any, any textile, um, type of artistry that you really want to do. And so, um, and like I was telling Spencer Vitigo, it's it's when you are a classroom teacher in public schools, you open the doors and kids come, you know, because that's what they do. But when you open a business such as this, I think some of what you have to have is a a good name that's going to be a um a motivation and an inspiration and a reason for people to want to come and visit you and sure. take classes from you. So the name so much class was actually born at the 2022 international quilt festival in a parking lot, trying to decide what my name was going to be. So it was pretty cool. Yeah, I love that. I I love I love here. I love thinking about you know sitting in a parking lot at a quilt festival. Um, you know, yeah. and and you know coming up with this name and how this name would play into, you know, the kind of the backbone to your business, yeah. right? And and that that would be a part of that. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to hear more about you know you decided on the name, but then how did how did people start to find out? Like from what I understand, your your shop is growing. You know, people are taking yeah. classes, and you know things are are going well. How did this come to be? Like, are you advertising in you know a, on social? Are you are you you know taking ads in the newspaper? Or do you have billboards? You know, commercials? You know, it could be none of those things. I, I'm curious how. You know, how do you get your name out there? If I'm starting a quote shop, I'm probably overwhelmed with just the prospect of getting people to hear about me for the first time. Yeah, you're right. Um, it has been. Um, I think the marketing side of things is um, probably my greatest learning curve. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, the financial side comes along with it. But, you know, that's because, you know, you've been running a household for a good number of years. But the sure. marketing side, you don't market your house. You know, you, yeah. you got to market the business. And so with that being said, um, a lot of it has been very organic, word of mouth. Um, okay. I, I had a really good reputation, still do as a classroom teacher and teaching sewing classes and quilting classes. And so that just kind of started. Um uh, I initially started with, um, Facebook. Um, and so that's where so much class is and, and it has been since I had begun. Um, eventually I will be adding probably Instagram, um, to it. Um, uh, Google business is another place, um, that, uh, um, I've, I'm on, you know, so when people go and they're looking for a quilt shop, you know, my name pops up. And so that's a good thing. And some of this side of the marketing, actually the, um, the 
a small business development center has helped me with because knowing that I'm, that's not mm, in my wheelhouse or hadn't been in my wheelhouse, that's where I knew that I needed help in that direction. Um, and so, uh, other things that I have done, um, the building that I am in, um, there's a gentleman that had stopped by and there's a, a magazine that's, um, uh, for our area and it promotes businesses. And so, um, I'm featured in, in that magazine. I took out an ad in that magazine. Um, it is a pretty cool ad. Um, uh, and it has a little, um, uh, spotlight as to a narrative and, uh, that has, um, that goes out to, I think they have like 25 or 250,000 copies of that. And it goes into the oh, hotels. Wow. It goes into other businesses where, you know, people that are visiting here, um, can pick it up and, um, uh, you know, look at it. And uh, my 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 son is looking for the ad. It's on page one one ten. <laughs> Not like I don't know the page of this. <laughs> I love I love that you know what page you're on. I think that's I I just I don't know what it is about that that I love so much. <laughs> so let me just uh, this is this is my ad, and so it's a two page spread, and so oh, it I is. I love it. It's pretty cool. Um, you know. Um, there are, um, uh, Sandy, let me just, let me just like give a, you know, voice narration here. So we're looking at, at the magazine and, and she's got kind of on the same page, you know, one is, uh, you know, the photo of her with a quote in the background. And then on the other side is, um, presumably some, some text. I don't know if you want to describe that a little bit. It's the narrative. Yeah, it's the narrative. It's a spotlight where okay. I was asked um, some questions, like what inspired you to start your business? What are some uh, some things that set your business apart from others? And then what would you like to highlight for our readers in 2023? And so I responded to those questions in this um, in this book. And so, I love that. That's yeah. so cool. So, yeah, that one was really, really good. Um, uh, I've been asked to uh, maybe come up with a few other ideas, maybe a radio narrative uh, type of thing, um, a uh, an ad. And I haven't had an opportunity to do that yet. But, um, you know, it's but I'm having fun. I think uh, um, uh, the. I'm learning a lot about Facebook. I'm going to go back to that because um, when I was a principal, I did not participate in um, Facebook. And so for me, Facebook is relatively new, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, may may sound a little odd to some folks, but um, I didn't when I was in public school, I didn't want my life out there online. Um, I needed to keep it very professional and that's what I did. And so now that I have a business, um, one of the major market marketing, uh, tools is Facebook. So learning about, um, like, follow, share, um, I'm learning a lot about, um, what all of that means. And so, my, my customer base is growing. Um, as I have been teaching classes um, and people have uh, completed a project, they're posting it online, and that in and of itself starts to speak volumes. Um, I had finished a class. Um, I actually had, had worked on a T-shirt class, and um, uh, one of the customers has just posted her pictures online. And oh my goodness, um, she gave me credit and everything for helping her with the elements of design for the secondary pattern that came out. And it just was, and so as a result of that, I've had numerous phone calls and people texting me, where's your website, you know, type of wow. thing. So, so just the organic nature of this, I do plan to host an open house um, here at this, at my studio. And then this way that'll also generate, you know, other, other people coming into the studio. 
Yeah. So. Wow. No, I mean, I, and one of the best things about kind of a, a lot of the different things that you spoke there, you know, specifically word of mouth and how that's kind of, um, you know, traveled across, you know, some social media and that's coming to mm-hmm. you, you know, back people wondering where your website is that a lot of that is free. Right. And, and, and that is so, you know, fun and savvy is to kind of dig in and find more ways to, you know, market in ways that don't cost money. Right. Because, you know, I think a lot of times, you know, whether it's print that you have to pay for, or, you know, you're boosting your ads on social or you're, you know, taking, you know, you're, you have a billboard or whatever. I think those are all great avenues. Um, but there is a limit to them because, you know, there is only so much budget for that, but there is literally no limit to the amount of word of mouth that you can help contribute to, right. That, that it comes to you and it goes back out and kind of this, this yeah, back very, and forth with yeah, your customers. Yes. Yes. It's cyclical and it's free. And, yeah. and I love that so much. Um, Me so too. thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. I know. Yeah. You too. Um, Sandy. So we're kind of running up on time here. One thing, um, you know, before we get going, I wanted to ask, what would your main piece of advice be for someone who's considering opening up a quilt shop right now? Um, and they're considering taking that leap as someone who just did it, what advice do you have for them? Oh, wow. Um, I would say develop the business plan and articulate it and look at your strengths, your weaknesses, and uh, other uh, other concerns that you may have. Um, be true to yourself. I think is an is another one, but I think developing a strong business plan and leaving leaving opportunities for flexibility, because even though my business plan that I had written, I thought I had it all put together, it has evolved and have that um, wherewithal to be accepting of change. Um, we're as as human beings, we are not. Um, often um, reticent to change because we like it done the same old, same old way because we did it that way for a hundred years and we're going to do it again for another hundred years. Doesn't mean that it's the right thing, but you get, you got to be true to yourself and figure out who, who you are and what you really are about. And I think that um, the advice is to come up with a strong business plan. And I love that. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. And I think you just need to listen to the market, you know, and, and do your homework. Um, it's, it's all about so much class doing your homework. Um, but I think that, yeah, those are, those are the things that I would give as advice. No, I think that that's, I think that's really, really pertinent. And I love that your piece of advice kind of ties in everything that you've said so far, right? Like we've talked about the business plan, we've talked about the marketing, we've talked about, Mm -hmm. you know, really making sure that you listen to your customers and address their needs. And, you know, ultimately, that's, you know, from my understanding, kind of your, your final piece Mm -hmm. of advice. And so, you know, I just want to say, Sandy, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Um, Again, this is Sandy Labby with so much class in College Station, Texas, Um, you know, for sure if you're in the area um you know i you know make sure you check that shop out and uh you know again thank you so much for being on with us today thank you i really appreciate it it was an honor to be part of your podcast series thanks again thank you for listening to the quilt shop be sure to subscribe on apple Podcasts, spotify youtube or wherever you get your podcasts leave a rating or review to let us know what you think. For more interviews with business owners, visit likeso.com slash interviews, where you'll find transcripts, show notes, and videos for all our episodes. Come on.